Anytime. Good evening, uh, everyone. <coughs> Thank you so much for coming out tonight uh, for this uh, presentation. We're going to hear from our good friend and leader here at Chosen People Ministries, uh, Mitch Glazer. Uh, this is the Feinberg Center, and it's one of the things that we want to do uh, each year. Usually in the spring, we're trying to present um, something more practical in nature called the Daniel Fuchs Lectures. And uh, then in the fall, we have the Feinberg Lectures, which are usually more of, of an academic uh, approach. So you can be aware of that if you're not already. Uh, just a word about Daniel Fuchs. Uh, I learned something today that I actually didn't know. But uh, he, for whom this uh, presentation is named, uh, was a former leader of Chosen People Ministries when it was called the American Board of Missions to the Jews. I was very active as a CEO and president of this organization and uh, was noted for having uh, trained about 75 uh, different missionaries to go out all over the world, uh, taking the message of the gospel to the Jewish people in particular. And I also learned uh, that he was a graduate of Talbot School of Theology. I didn't know that until uh, really? uh, I read this today. So uh, from one, one president of the organization uh, for whom the lectureship is named uh, to our current president, I think most of you know who Mitch Glazer is. Uh, it's always an honor for me to get a chance to, to introduce
Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Greg. Well, good evening, everybody. It's good to see a lot of friends. Uh, tonight, we're going to uh, honor mm -hmm. God and honor the Jewish people by paying attention to this day of remembrance. It's on this day that we remember those Jewish people who perished in the Holocaust. And the impact of that uh, uh, transcends uh, days and weeks and months and years and generations. And the Messianic Jewish community was deeply affected uh, by the Holocaust. And so we're going to take a look at that. And uh, as we do our reflections on Yom HaShoah, this evening we're going to actually pay careful attention and focus on the Messianic Jews, those Jews who believe that Jesus is the Messiah, in the Warsaw Ghetto. And uh, I know that when I first became a believer, I was sure that my grandparents, for example, never heard about Yeshua, never heard about Jesus. And I remember the day I was so uh, overjoyed when I visited the American Board of Missions to the Jews' work in southern Florida that was run by Martin Clayman. And this was when I was a very, very young guy, a new believer, maybe about six months in the Lord. I went down to visit my grandparents, whom my parents instructed me I could not say a word about my faith to. And, uh, but I did find out that Chosen People Ministries or the American Board of Missions to the Jews had a monthly fellowship meeting there. And I went, and there were probably, I don't know, 50, 60, 70 uh, very mature adults of my age now and older uh, who were rejoicing in the Lord, speaking Yiddish. And I thought that it was the most marvelous thing that I'd ever seen because I thought that only young Jewish people believed in Jesus. And, but it was then that I started having hope, even for my own grandparents. And uh, as far as I know, they never came to faith. Uh, but I can tell you that there is no doubt that the gospel went out in power to both uh, Jews and non-Jews uh, in Eastern Europe uh, during the Holocaust period and prior to the Holocaust. And I've done extensive research on this period, and it's very encouraging to me, as I hope it will be encouraging to you. So we're going to look at this, and in a sense, uh, we're going to focus just a little bit on the Messianic Jewish people who perished in the Holocaust. Not that we don't care about so many others. We do, deeply. It's a heart, heartbreaking story. And, uh, but most people do not know that there were Messianic Jews uh, who were believers during the Holocaust. Most people don't know that there were Messianic Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto. And so we're going to examine that tonight. And I hope that will give you a deeper appreciation for what God did in this dark and difficult time. And so in order to help me explain this to you, uh, I found what I think is a pretty good eight-minute film that talks about the Warsaw Ghetto. And we'll give you some background so that once we get into it, uh, then I can refer to it. All righty? So sit back, relax. It's an eight-minute uh, movie. Let's have the lights off before we even begin. Okay, let's have the lights off. And could I ask you to make sure that your phones are off? Okay, make sure your phones are off. Tuck them away if you don't mind. And uh, see, I'm even doing it with my phone. Okay, so uh, tuck your phones away, turn them off because uh, this is uh, a very serious evening. In my book, Yom HaShoah is the most serious. Uh, it's not a biblical holiday, but it's, it's probably one of the most, if not the most serious and sober uh, Jewish uh, day other than Yom Kippur. So why don't you watch the movie and then we'll come back and we'll talk about it.
Jewish people for years have always felt uh, or been portrayed as victims. And we need to re remember that even though there was uh, little choice uh, for the Jewish people but to endure, to suffer, and, and to die. And it wasn't as if the Jewish people started this kind of battle. But, but you have to remember that there was defiance and that there, there was uh, self-defense and there was dignity uh, in uh, the Warsaw Ghetto. And some people forget that and don't know it, and I think it's really important. And I think that um, this is part of the whole process in un of understanding uh, the Messianic Jewish role during that time as well. Um, and um, we will learn that uh, the Messianic Jews, the Jewish believers in Jesus, uh, also uh, lived with dignity and fought with dignity and died with dignity. And, um, and so uh, we'll learn some lessons. Now, uh, just by way of introduction, for many years, uh, I believe that there was uh, very little information about uh, Messianic Jews, sometimes we're called Hebrew Christians, none of us like that name anymore, but Messianic Jews, Hebrew Christians, Jewish believers uh, in the Warsaw Ghetto. Uh, Dan Cohn Sherbach, a, uh, an American uh, Jewish reform rabbi who's a historian who's lived in London uh, many years and whom I know, uh, wrote this in, in his book on Messianic Judaism. Following the Holocaust, missions to the Jewish people ceased to function in those cities where the Jewish population had been largely eliminated. In Warsaw, for example, only a few hundred Jews survived the war. Most of the workers stationed there escaped before the outbreak of the war, while others in the Warsaw, died in the Warsaw Ghetto or in one of several concentration camps. So Dan Cohn Sherbach is saying, all we know about Messianic Jews and those who work with Jewish missions like Chosen People Ministries is that they died. They either left before or they died. And I'll tell you how that worked. The Gentile missionaries to the Jews, for the most part, got out. The Jewish missionaries to the Jews died or somehow miraculously survived. Uh, but is that all we can know? Not really. I think, I don't think Dr. Uh, Sherbach is totally wrong, but I think uh, though there's very little known about the life and testimony of Jewish believers in the Warsaw Ghetto, I think there's actually a lot more than he thought. And uh, there are a couple of factors in this. Uh, after studying all of this myself, I realized that if you do not look at the Jewish believers in the Warsaw Ghetto through, in part, Catholic eyes, you miss it. Now, that's hard for some of you, okay? If you're Catholic, it's, it's uh, wonderful for you. Uh, but if you're not, and, uh, then it's difficult for you. Uh, but there, I've been to Warsaw many times, and it's, very, it's, a, it's a most unusual place in Europe uh, because there are, uh, there's a closer relationship between Protestants and Evangelicals and Messianic Jews and Catholics than there is in many other countries, including Italy. I mean, in Italy, nobody would talk to each other. But in, in Warsaw, they eat dinner together. They have services together. And uh, you, you just can't be some kind of Christian in Poland, even today, without having some engagement with, with the Catholic Church. It's just impossible. Uh, one of our own dear uh, uh, staff members, Michael Zinn, uh, quite often uh, goes uh, to Poland. He speaks Polish, but he goes to Poland, and uh, he's very fond of working with a whole group of uh, Catholic monks and hundreds of them, and he likes doing Passover seders for them. So if you can imagine a bunch of, a couple of hundred Catholic monks with Michael, who's 
beard goes down to here, who always wears a yarmulke, doing Passover together. I mean, it's a very strange thing. But you have to understand that in Poland, um, uh, even the Catholic Church is quite divided, and there are definitely many what we would call Catholic evangelicals in the United States, and, uh, and then there are just purely uh, devoted uh, Catholics. Uh, but uh, the Catholics are the ones who survived, so they got to write the history. So that's how, you, that's how we know what happened. And you see it uh, in many different places. In the churches, you see it, and in the history books. And so I discovered that the Catholic voice needed to be heard if we're to understand the role of the Jewish believers in the Warsaw Ghetto, because a lot of what we know comes from Catholic uh, sources. Uh, secondly, Jewish sources are also very valuable. And believe it or not, there was a lot said about the Jewish believers from Jewish sources in the Warsaw Ghetto. And it wasn't complimentary for the most part. Uh, but there was a lot said. And, um, and then also I discovered that there was actually a lot said uh, by some of the Protestant churches. There was one Reformed church which sat right on the ghetto. There were two or three Catholic churches almost in the ghetto. Two of them were in the ghetto. And then there's one Reformed Protestant church that's almost in the ghetto. And because uh, you can walk the ghetto, you still see the boundaries if you go to Warsaw. You know, it's, it's easy. And you can go visit parts of the wall and everything else. And so one day uh, I was there with, the, with uh, a few uh, people and we uh, knocked on the door of the Protestant Reformed Church to see if anybody was home. And uh, lo and behold, they were not only home, but out came the, um, th they had a full-time church historian working for the Reformed Church. And uh, we sat in a room, and he was very happy. I uh, spoke English. He was very happy to tell me the entire story of all the Jewish believers that went to this Reformed church and how it was emptied of all the Jews during the Holocaust. And he said most of them were killed. Uh, but uh, there was uh, quite a few there. And I said, wow, that's interesting. He said, yeah, actually, look at that picture on the wall. And there was this picture, not, uh, probably from the early, 19th, uh, early 20th century, of a uh, nice-looking businessman uh, and, uh, and his family. And the, the historian said uh, he donated uh, the uh, furniture in this room and, and helped uh, finance part of the church. And I said, who was he? He says, well, he was one of the Jewish believers in the church. And so you see these sort of hints all over uh, Warsaw. And you have to understand, if there were so many Jewish believers before the Warsaw Ghetto, then where did they go? Well, all the Jewish people went into the ghetto. And so were there Jewish believers in the Warsaw Ghetto? The real question is, were there Jewish believers in Warsaw before the ghetto? And the answer to that question is a resounding uh, yes. Now, uh, let me just give you just a little bit of a tour, if I could. If I could, which I can. Okay, there we go. All right, so let's just take a little bit of a look at Uh, that there were a lot of Jewish people uh, in Europe before. So uh, the usual number for Jewish people in Poland, you ready? Before the Holocaust, three million. Now that's half as many as there are in the United States. And the largest number would guess where? Warsaw. Warsaw. Uh, so Poland actually had more Jewish people than what we can call the former Soviet Union, or um, uh, which would include, uh, in this map, would include 
to Ukraine and Russia and so on. So we're talking about an enormous Jewish population in Poland uh, beforehand. And uh, where were the missions to the Jews? Well, the missions to the Jews, if you look at the map, uh, they were in Warsaw. They were in Lvov. Michael Zinn, who I was talking about, is from Lvov. They were in Lodz, L-O-D-J, where there was another ghetto. Uh, have any of you been to Israel? Some of you? Have you ever, anybody been to Haifa? Do you know Bet Bethesda? Uh, the, uh, have you ever, anybody been to a lot, to the shelter, where John and Judy Pecks are? Okay. The shelter and Beit Chesder, Chesder, that's a New York accent uh, pronouncing Hebrew, so Beit, uh, Beit Chesda and the shelter are owned by the European Bethel Mission. And the European Bethel Mission was started by Leon Rosenberg, who for a number of years before World War II uh, led a Messianic congregation in Odessa and then was moved from Odessa because of persecution he moved to someplace much safer, Lodz, and uh, where there was uh, a terrible ghetto in Lodz as well. But he started an orphanage for Messianic Jewish children that went through all, a lot, all of the early years of the Holocaust, and then he got out within the nick of time uh, in the 1942 probably and uh, was able to uh, go to, uh, I think he went to England, but he ended up in California. Don't ask me. And he was in Israel for a while and then ended up in California, and, uh, and he started the European Bethel uh, uh, mission. Uh, and then you have Krakow. If you see Krakow at the bottom, if you, um, can you see it? I wish I had a laser pointer because then I could shine it in your eyes, too, which I, lo I love to do. Uh, but uh, uh, never let a, a boy play with a laser pointer. Uh, and so if you, Krakow's down at the bottom in the south. It's really in the southwest. Uh, has anybody been to Krakow? OK, so Krakow's quite an interesting place. There's a Jewish revival in Krakow right now. They actually have uh, re redone the Jewish district in Krakow and you have about 12 or 15 uh, Jewish restaurants in a redone, urbanized, hip Krakow. And they all have, uh, they all have uh, uh, Jewish singing klezma groups. And you can actually go and have a traditional Jewish meal, which is goose, by the way, just so you know. So you have a traditional Jewish meal, kreplach and goose. And then you have a, uh, a klezmer show. And uh, it's like, you know, relives it. And then there's a couple of synagogues. One is a live synagogue. The other is a museum synagogue. And you can go and take a tour of these synagogues. But Krakow had hundreds of thousands of Jewish people. And the reason I mention it is because some of you know Friends of Israel, which is based out of Philadelphia. It just so happens that, that uh, uh, Friends of Israel, the founder of, of Friends of Israel, uh, was a, uh, a missionary in Krakow with the British Jews Society and moved from Krakow to Brooklyn, where he worked with, Leop uh, with Joseph Hoffman Cohen, our, the son of our founder, who got him out. And then Victor Buxbazen moved to Philadelphia because he couldn't get along with Joseph Cohen moved to Philadelphia, took over this little Bible study. The Friends of Israel Gospel and Relief by, uh, Organization was founded, became Friends of Israel, which is still a significant uh, Jewish ministry uh, in the United States. And so Krakow was a, a very important uh, spot. So just letting you know that there was, there was quite a bit that happened. We'll look a little bit more at the Jewish missions uh, in a moment. Uh, I'm especially grateful for an incredible book that uh, was written by a devout Polish Catholic historian who survived the Holocaust and lived in Chicago and taught at the University of Chicago. And his name is Peter Dombowski, he just died a couple years ago, and he wrote a book called Christians in the Warsaw Ghetto. 
Christians in the Warsaw Ghetto. And it's probably the best source in English of information about what God was doing through believers in the Warsaw Ghetto. And uh, again, there, were, there was not a lot of resources there, but there was some. Todd Endelman, who's a great Jewish historian, recently retired from the University of Michigan. Uh, in 1997, he wrote an interesting article, which I have read, and you should definitely read if you're interested in this stuff or have trouble sleeping at night. Uh, he wrote an article in 1997 entitled, Jewish Converts in 19th Century Warsaw, a Quantitative Analysis. If that's not an intriguing name, I don't know what it is. In the Journal of Jewish Social Studies. But Endelman uh, also wrote a book called Apostasy in the Modern World, uh, which is all about Jewish people who believe in Jesus from Eastern Europe. Guess who the apostates are? You got it, the Messianic Jews. So let's just say Todd Endelman takes a strong position on this. But there's a lot of great research, and he, he goes over baptismal records and all sorts of other records and comes up with, with numbers for, of Jewish believers in Jesus, both Protestant and Catholic. And Endelman also makes a distinction between those Jews who became believers in Jesus who were part of the Jewish missions. And if they were part of the Jewish missions, some would call them Protestants, some would call them Messianic Jews, some would call them confused, but they were, they were the, they had uh, a quite uh, a, a history. Then there was, uh, if, if you want to know, the, the number that everybody came up with before the Holocaust for Jews who believe in Jesus in Poland was about 65,000. That's the general number that people use. Um, then there's Emanuel Ringelblum. Do you know who he is? Emanuel Ringelblum. Emanuel Ringelblum uh, was an incredibly significant person. Uh, as a young man, he went into the uh, Warsaw Ghetto. Uh, he was one of the uh, early staff of YIVO, uh, the Yiddish Institute. It's some Yiddish name. But YIVO is based in Manhattan now and it merged with the Jewish Historical Society. And Ringelblum uh, lived in Poland, not in Warsaw. He was kind of swept into the ghetto. But Ringelblum uh, put together a group of young Jewish historians in the ghetto called the Oineg Shabbos, Oineg Shabbat. And, the, and it was a code word because they didn't want to use it. They just talked about Oineg Shabbos. And the Oineg Shabbos group would write history documenting the atrocities of the Warsaw Ghetto. We would know almost nothing about the Warsaw Ghetto from a Jewish perspective if not for Ringelblum. And he knew that he was going to die. He knew that they were all going to die. And so what Ringelblum did is he wrote the histories on scraps of paper, of pieces of cloth, I mean anything they could get their hands on and hid them in metal milk carton, milk cans, and buried them in the ghetto, hoping that one day they would be discovered, sort of like a strange version of a time capsule. And there were three of these uh, metal canisters with thousands of pages of information, all written in Yiddish. And we found two of them so far. And uh, I've been to the Ringelblum Museum in Warsaw, and I've seen a lot of the original pieces, and I've seen the milk cans. And uh, I mean, he was a, a, a young 27, 28-year-old visionary. Uh, he had a PhD in, in history before he entered the Warsaw Ghetto. And so it was a, he was a, just a very significant uh, person. But he was a hardline socialist. He had no use for the Orthodox Jews, and he had no use for the Messianic Jews. He had no use for anybody who wasn't a socialist and didn't, he had no use for anybody who believed in God. And so he discount, discounted the conversion, so to speak, of every Messianic Jew because when there's no God, there's nothing to turn your life over to, right? You know, if you start with no God, you end up in some pretty interesting places. 
So, so it's, lo it's wonderful to hear about, to read Ringenblum's talking about the authenticity of the faith of the Messianic Jews because he didn't believe in what they had faith in. So, there, so he wrote every, every Messianic Jew off as someone who believed in Jesus in order to gain benefit during the Holocaust. Follow me? And then there was my favorite person, and that's Ludwig Hertzfeld. Ludwig Hertzfeld became a Catholic in his early 20s. He was a medical doctor. He ran the medical, uh, he actually ran the hospitals within the ghetto, and he ran a medical school in the Warsaw Ghetto. They actually had a fully, function medic fully functioning medical school through the first two years of medical school. And uh, he had cut his eye teeth on typhus, handling typhus in Bulgaria and Slovakia during the First World War. And the reason why Hertzfeld is famous is because he basically was one of the first people to categorize and describe blood types. So whenever you think of your, whether you're type O or, or O positive or type A or type B, it was a Messianic Jewish Catholic who invented the blood types. And, uh, and he's well known. And there's a nice picture of Hertzfeld, which, Bobby, you did do that, right? Okay. Whew. Thank you. Because I didn't do it and I thought maybe it was moving on its own. Mm -mm. Now, I, I, I appreciate Dembowski's book to no end. It's, it's incredible. But unfortunately, he did not take into consideration the many journals of Jewish missions and the reports of, of the Jewish mission leaders to a group called the International Council Christian Approach to the Jews, which functioned all the way through the Holocaust, eventually merged into the very liberal World Council of Churches. But in many ways, it was the predecessor of what we call the Lausanne Consultation on Jewish Evangelism and uh, was a model for it. And so there were plenty of reports of what was happening in the Warsaw Ghetto that, that, that could be known that came from the leaders of the Jewish missions and were recorded in the uh, ICCAG materials. So you can read all this stuff. So again, Dembowski was great, but he was really pretty Catholic, which is okay. You learn a lot from that. But there was a lot in the Jewish community, some in the Messianic Jewish community, and quite a bit in the Jewish mission. So we know, we know, we know a lot. Now, Bobby, can we go back to the beginning, sort of? And let me see where we are. Yeah, that's good. That's perfect. Okay. So there you can see uh, some of the Jewish mission stuff that was going on at that time, which I find particularly fascinating because uh, if you notice the second one there, that's the American Board of Missions to the Jews, now Chosen People Ministries. Uh, our ministry was operating in Warsaw for decades prior to the Holocaust. In fact, we owned a property uh, on the other side of the river, and I went looking for it. I was going to try and get it back for us, but it's gone. And it was bombed. Uh, CMJ, the church's ministry among the Jews, the uh, Anglican mission to the Jewish people, they also had a lovely property. That was bombed, and now I think it was uh, Nissan, I think, has its headquarters there or something, one of the car companies. Uh, and so there was quite a bit, and let me just keep going, Mild May Mission to the Jews, and uh, did it move? I think we need a new one of these things. Uh, there we go. There's the Bethel Mission to the Jews, that was uh, Leon Rosenberg. Danish Mission to the Jews, the Bridget, British Society for the Propagation of the Gospel Among the Jews. 
Aren't you glad that you don't work for that organization? I mean, that's a, that's a long name. And uh, the Barbican Mission to the Jews, which was another Jewish mission. Uh, the Hebrew Christian Alliance. Uh, what you have to understand is there were thousands of Messianic Jews in Warsaw. And there probably were 12 to 15 Messianic congregations in Warsaw. And there were at least a dozen or more Jewish ministries operating in Warsaw, but then there were the Messianic congregations, oftentimes attached to the missions. And then you had a lot of evangelical churches, Protestant churches in particular, that were involved with Jewish ministry. And in my estimation, probably 50 to 60 percent of the Jewish believers in Warsaw went to Catholic churches who were uh, even adult uh, believers. And so you really had a, a, a robust messianic movement in Warsaw before the ghetto. But where do you think they all ended up? If they weren't working for a British Jewish mission like Jacob Yach, who was uh, his father, Basil Yach, uh, worked for CMJ, the Anglican mission. Yeah, it's pretty cold in here. It could be warmed up. I'm going to, can't be, is there a way to make it warmer? Are all of you warm? You're cold? Yeah, I'm cold. When everybody starts putting on their jackets, it's kind of a hint. <laughs> you know, when the speaker says, can I have my coat? Okay. <laughs> so if we can, there we go, the woman with the key to break into, okay, put it on like 80, you know. <laughs> it might say 71, but it ain't. <laughs> Well, let me, uh, let me maybe share with you a little bit about the growth of the Jewish population for a moment in, in Warsaw, just so you understand some more of the, the background. And Todd Endelman does an, a nice little uh, uh, summary. He says, the Jewish population of Warsaw was 16,000, and then in 1816 it grew to 41,000. In 18, no, 41,000 in 1856, and skyrocketed to 337,000 on the eve of World War I. But most people would say that by the time the Nazis invaded Poland, the Jewish population of Warsaw alone was well over a half a million, but somewhere between a half a million and a million Jewish people. So basically, Warsaw was the Brooklyn of Poland. <laughs> The Nazis invaded Poland in 1939, and within a short time, Jewish regulations were published and implemented, leading to the construction of the ghetto. Um, the following paragraph uh, from A Teacher's Guide to the Holocaust, I, th I just thought this was a great summary, and, we'll, and you can follow it along the timeline also. Uh, it talks about the ghetto. It was established in November 1940. It was surrounded by a wall and contained nearly a half a million Jews. So a half a million Jews at one time were in the Warsaw Ghetto. I think some people said it was built to handle 140,000 people. Some number like that. About 45,000 Jews died there in 1941 alone as a result of overcrowding Hard labor, lack of sanitation, insufficient food, starvation, and disease. During 42, most of the ghetto residents began to be deported, and they went to Treblinka, which was a death camp. So they went to, unlike Theresienstadt and some other, which were not necessarily death, death camps. And they were deported in 42, and there were about 60,000 Jews left in the ghetto. And then the ghetto uprising happened in 1943, when the Germans, commanded by Jürgen Stroop, who's really the bad guy of this whole story, uh, attempted to raise the ghetto and deport the remaining inhabitants in Treblinka. That's when Mordechai Anilevich, with his headquarters in Mila 18, if that's familiar to you, that's because Leon Uris uh, wrote a novel 
Uh, he wrote Exodus and he wrote Mila 18, all about uh, the uh, revolt. And uh, the miracle that happened with that under Anilevich uh, and the resistance during this, um, this moment when, the, uh, when they were trying to destroy uh, the ghetto uh, was that he unified all the different Jewish resistance parties, the religious ones, the socialist ones, the liberal ones, the different versions of communist ones. And so he was able to, only a 24-year-old kid, but he was able to uh, link them all together. The bitter fighting lasted 28 days and ended with the destruction uh, of the ghetto. And if you go to Warsaw, you'll be able to see Mila 18, you'll be able to see some monuments to the fighters, you'll be able to see the sort of the cave in the rock where Anilevich and his leaders hid, and you'll be able to see the absolutely magnificent new museum of the history of, of, of Jewish Poland. It's not only one of the best museums I've ever been to, but it's, it's one of the best museums uh, of the Jewish people. It's one of the best museums in general. I haven't been to the Museum of the Bible yet, but I, I'm sure they were inspired by this museum because it, it's, it's got incredible digital uh, facility and it's huge. And so I've now tried to do the museum twice. So the le first time I started at the beginning and ended up like you know a quarter of the way. So I said, I know what I'm going to do this time. I'm going to start at the end and then work my way back. And I got another quarter, so I still have a half to go. And uh, so you, you, need a, you need a lot, but it's, it's, it's a magnificent uh, a museum. Uh, so just if you look at the timeline, October 1939 through 1940 was the gradual isolation and gathering of the Jewish population. 40 through 42, the ghetto was sealed off from the other side. Uh, and by the way, during that whole time, there actually was a streetcar that went down the middle of the ghetto. And Polish citizens, like Dembrowski, who talks about his rides through the middle of the ghetto, would have to ride through the ghetto and then back through the ghetto every day. And they could look on uh, either side of it. So uh, the resettlement, which is also referred uh, to its German, it was called the Acteon. Uh, the Acteon was basically uh, uh, the transport to the concentration camps and the liquidation of more than 300,000 Jewish people. Um, uh, there is a, a, a word that I cannot pronounce, uh, but there was a train station in the ghetto, and that's where they would bring people. And you can go and visit that. It's a memorial uh, today. And... Uh, so it didn't take long to liquidate uh, almost a half a million people. Now, from October 42 through 43, the Jewish resistance, uh, ups, uh, the uprising we just learned about by the remaining uh, Jewish population in the ghetto was followed by the total destruction of the ghetto. So by 1943, the ghetto was destroyed there were only perhaps a few thousand Jews left out of all the Jews in Poland. So that was it. Now just a little bit more about uh, uh, the Messianic movement and then we'll, we'll go on from there. Uh, we learned a lot uh, from the International Missionary Council, Christian Approach to the Jews, uh, Vienna meeting in 19... Uh, 37 about what was happening prior to the Nazi invasion. So let me read it. The American Board of Missions to the Jews, Chosen People Ministries, has a center in Warsaw on the east of the river. They have room for some inquirers in addition to general evangelistic work. The Mile May Mission to the Jews, which is Messianic testimony today in England, has a hall in the Jewish quarter in Warsaw, and their work mainly touches poorer Jews. The American European Fellowship is in Warsaw, Warsaw and works with children. They also have a villa in Radoso, which is used in the summer for children's work. The Bethel Mission in Lodz has an evangelistic center and a colony. In addition, in Poland, there's one Pentecostal evangelist, um, of open brethren, some closed brethren, and a few private evangelists living by faith. 
And the four major missions in Warsaw all worked together in close cooperation. So that was a snapshot of Jewish missions in Warsaw in 1937. And again, CMJ built Emanuel Hall, that was in 1927, a showcase facility for the Jewish believers. Uh, CMJ had the precursor of the Feinberg Center in Warsaw that was uh, led by J.J. J.I. Lundsman, H.C. Carpenter, and the incredible Paul Levertov, who is a, a great uh, Messianic Jewish scholar who translated, who created one of the, a beautiful communion service in Hebrew and in Yiddish. We have copies of his Hebrew service. And, uh, and all of that work uh, was, of course, destroyed. Uh, Basil Yach, who is the son of, uh, the father of Jacob Yach, uh, was, uh, was martyred. He was killed. He couldn't be found for a long time. But his son, uh, Jacob, was actually taking cl classes at the CMJ Training Center in Warsaw. And he was working with CMJ, the British Jewish Mission, and actually went to um, England to speak at, a summer at, speak at a conference. And his wife was pregnant. She was British. And so the baby came a little early. And uh, immediately after the baby was born, the Nazis invaded Poland. That's how Yach survived. And he is one of the great scholars. He wrote um, The Jewish People in Jesus Christ, his PhD dissertation, if you've not read it, it's classic. And then he wrote The Jewish People in Jesus Christ after Auschwitz, also a incredible uh, book. Uh, what I'm trying to give you an appreciation for is that the Messianic Jewish movement in Warsaw was probably more robust than the Messianic Jewish movement in New York City. And it was wiped out. Just like the Jewish population was wiped out. Um, now, uh, here's a, a report that came through the International Missionary Council about what was happening um, in Poland about the time of the Warsaw Ghetto. When the Nazis invaded Poland in 39, conditions among the Jews were already bad. But after the invasion, this is a report, the final solution in Rall arrived in Poland like a raging storm from hell. Jews and missionaries to the Jews were rounded up, taken to concentration camps, or killed. The actual bombing of Poland also was severe, did severe damage to the country. Chaos was everywhere, and the work of the missions ground to a full halt from which it would never recover. Thousands of executions are reported. Hundreds of thousands are in concentration camps and compulsory labor camps. Three and a half million Jews are exposed to the worst vindictiveness of the Nazis. 200,000 more from all parts of the Reich form a terrible ghetto at Lublin, where destitution and plague are adding to their ministries. How many native missionaries have been cut off by the war and the work of all British societies have been discontinued? The Danish mission at Lvov has been brought to an end. It is not known whether the American board is still able to work. Some missionaries from the small Baltic states are also among the refugees. All the missionary activities in German territories, formerly carried on by British societies, are presumed to have come to an end. Extensive work in Poland has been suspended including the work of the Church Mission to the Jews, the British Society for the Propagation of the Gospel among the Jews, the Mild May Mission to the Jews, and the Barbican Mission to the Jews. And just one quick further report on what happened to the CMJ Emanuel Hall facility. Four bombs fell on the mission premises of CMJ in Warsaw, which were destroyed together with the residences of the missionaries. Uh, Reverend Allison, the missionary at Lvov, escaped to Romania just before the Russian entry, and no organized missionary work is being carried out there. So, of course, it wasn't just Warsaw. It was, it was all over. In summary, 
missions to the Jews died in Poland. A slow death, a torturous death, but it died with the destruction of the ghetto in 1943. And Jewish missions and the Messianic movement died in Poland along with more than 800,000 Jewish people. That's what you have to understand. Now, according to Dembowski, uh, his number was interesting. He said that there were 52,000 Christians in the Warsaw Ghetto, and most of them were Catholic. We know that there were a lot more because he didn't really know the ones that were associated with Jewish missions because all of Dembowski's resources were from a couple of the Catholic priests who survived the ghetto and wrote histories of what happened and some archival information that survived the war in the churches. Uh, Philip Friedman, a Jewish historian of the Warsaw Ghetto, well known, asserts in a study that he published all the way back in 1957, which was only tw uh, 12 years after the end of the war. So it was, you know, it's pretty recent. He said, in Warsaw, there were more than 6,000 baptized Jews who were ordered to move into the ghetto. And then he adds a statement that is mind-boggling to me. So again, Friedman, who's a respected historian, says 6,000 baptized Jews were ordered by the Nazis to move into the ghetto where they established their own churches. Now, what does that mean? What did they start? The above makes me think that there may have been Messianic Jewish worship services in the Warsaw Ghetto. Maybe Messianic congregational services. How long did they last? Not long. The Jewish people didn't last. People were dying each day. People were being transported uh, to Treblinka and dying. But if there was, this is what I've always believed and finally was able to see it in black and white in the research. With all the thousands of Jewish believers, and that's just what Friedman and, and the others say. I'm sure there were more, actually. They were, they were put into the ghetto where they continued their testimony. And I'm going to show you more evidence of it. They continued their testimony until their dying breath. I gained some interesting sort of semi-personal insight into this uh, when I, with different eyes, read through a book that I had read many, many times and handed out to a lot of people called Night Cometh in the Morning, which was the testimony of a Polish Jewish believer by the name of Rachmiel Friedlin that I and Doug Pyle know personally, knew personally. And uh, uh, let me read what, what he writes. In late 1944, now I believe he had the year wrong when he wrote it. It was 43. <laughs> but I'll talk it over with him when I see him. So in late 1944, by hiding in cemeteries, deserted churches, and the homes of fearful friends, I was one of the few surviving Jews in Warsaw outside the ghetto. In that enclosure were 5,000 Jews, the last of War Warsaw's original 500,000. You realize, um, we don't know exactly what the numbers were, but, but you get an idea for it. By God's enabling, I secretly slipped into the ghetto and was able, and it's, that's not the only report of people slipping in and out of the ghetto. What I don't understand is why people just didn't, everybody just didn't leave if they could slip out. But they did slip in and out. I secretly slipped into the ghetto and was able to speak comfort to a few of the Jewish believers still alive. 1943. Other Jewish brethren heard the message and believed in Messiah Jesus. 
but my friends in the ghetto insisted that I leave. They said if God had preserved me thus far, I would be a witness to the woes they now experienced. At the end of the war, I could tell the story of their suffering, which he did. I was probably one of the last to leave the ghetto. It was only shortly afterward, excuse me, that the Germans obliterated the entire ghetto. <clears throat> Friedland was one of the most well-known Messianic Jewish survivors of the Holocaust, and his testimony was known far and wide. How many tracks with Rockmeal's testimony did you, have you handed out in your life, Doug? Last year we had a mistake at Cal, uh, Cal State uh, in San Diego. Two sessions, I think it was packed. All over. Thousands. Friedland eventually traveled to England, Israel, the United States, and actually served with a number of the Jewish missions uh, in the U.S. Endelman, who's no friend of Messianic Jews, writes this, the number of conversions in Warsaw was probably greater than the number recorded. He admitted, he, in, in, a, in, in addition to those he was speaking about uh, a Polish guy's research, and he said he omitted inadvertently due to defective records and those he was paid to omit. Don't ask me about that one. Those who were baptized by Anglican missionaries, agents of, this, of CMJ, among the Jews probably because he did not have access to their records. And that was a guy by the name of Yeshki Choisinki, Choisinki, who did research about this also, another Catholic guy. And uh, here's what Endelman says. We also should not simply assume that the majority of believers were Catholic. Endelman, reflecting on this other Polish guy's research, which studied the Warsaw Jewish population through the turn of the 20th century, affirms that the majority of Jewish converts to Christianity became Protestants. So Endelman affirms that most were Protestants. The ones who became believers through the Jewish missions, we want to call them Messianic Jews, but they were, they were identified as Protestants. Uh, he, he writes again, Endelman, third and last, denominational choice also underscores the pragmatic nature of conversions in 19th century Warsaw. Contrary to expectation, most Jews who became Christians did not become Roman Catholics. It's unfathomable living in Poland. In fact, and this is coming from a Jewish non-believer who does not like us and does not like Protestants, probably or Catholics. But in fact, only 39% became Catholics the same percentage that became Calvinists and joined that Reformed Church where I listened to the historian for an hour and a half, telling me all about the Jewish believers who went to his church. The remaining 22% were baptized as Lutherans. That makes a little bit of sense. In the last decades of the century, converting Jews were even less like Converted Jews were less likely to become Catholics. In the 1820s, 79% of converts chose Catholicism. In the next decade, the Catholic share fell to 47%. But the fall toward the end of the century, which would be the turn of the 20th century, was even more dramatic. Only 16% of converts chose Catholicism in the 80s. 24% in the 1890s, and 24% as well in the years 1900 to 1903. And he goes on to try and explain it. And he says, uh, number one, Jews, uh, chose, Jews who became Christians chose Protestantism more often than Catholicism because it was less offensive to them as secularists and victims of religious tolerance. Interesting. Roman Catholicism seemed idolatrous and ritualistic, while Protestantism, by comparison, appeared enlightened and rational. Now, I think what he's missing, 
there, Endelman, because he doesn't get it, is the work of the missions. Be the reason why the, the missions, which were all Protestant, had a more effective ministry among the Jewish people was because they were Jewish in orientation. They had Friday night services and Saturday morning services. They celebrated all the Jewish holidays. In one year, CM, in, at the turn of the century, CMJ reported almost a thousand Jewish people in Warsaw coming to faith. There was a movement of the Holy Spirit. Then, and in the, in the midst, in between the wars, we have records of literally thousands turning to the Lord. People say, well, those are the Jewish missions. So, you know, they don't write accurately. You know, even then we were accused of writing evangelistically. I want to tell you, we pay pretty close attention in Chosen People Ministries to the accuracy of our numbers. And I hope you do. And most of my peers in Jewish ministry today, I know they do too. And, uh, and so I think the British were pretty precise. And so was, was our ministry. So um, just going on a little further. So it's important in trying to determine the number of Jewish believers in the ghetto, especially those who may not have been identified with the two main Catholic parishes in the ghetto, um, it's possible that the Jewish believers who identified with the Jewish missions met privately, and therefore we do not have records of their activities, or it is possible, and this is a very real possibility, that eventually they couldn't continue their own services, and they met at the two Catholic churches which were actually in the ghetto. In the ghetto. And the reason for that, it was a safe place to meet. And it was a comfortable place, and they were welcome there. And there is the uh, a church of uh, Church of St. Augustine. And uh, let's see, it's the next one. That's St. Maria. Uh, next one. There you go. All Saints Church, I'm sorry. All Saints Church is right in the ghetto. And I've been in there many times. And you, if you look on their board where they tell their own history, they actually say from 1939 until 1943, the Jewish believers in Jesus met in this church. And Friedland's visit to the ghetto indicates that though some of the Jewish believers were inv involved with the Jewish missions or Protestant churches may have escaped prior to the ghetto, there can be little doubt based upon the numbers of longer term Jewish believers and assuming that their children followed their parents in their faith to some degree that there were many of these, both Catholic, non-Catholic, Protestant, and even Messianic Jewish believers within the Warsaw Ghetto. And I think there's good evidence uh, uh, to believe that. Uh, the Jewish believers were called uh, michas, michas. It's not a complimentary Yiddish word. And Ringelblum uses it, and other people use it, and the michas um, were, it was from the Hebrew word mechas for custom, tax, or levy. And it was a metaphorical uh, concept when it came to Jewish believers. And here's the way they played it. The Jewish believers were called mechas because it was viewed that the token or the tax that they paid for their own survival was baptism. So that's how they got the name. So they were called Mechas. And they were a well-known group within the Warsaw Ghetto. The problem is, is that there were two types. And this is for real. Um, the ones who were more nominal Catholics, for the most part, um, were well-known in the ghetto. Uh, uh, Adam Chernienko actually ran the Judenroute, actually ran the ghetto on behalf of the Gestapo. 
and he was a known convert to Catholicism. He was called the Mechas. Uh, Joseph Cerneski. Uh, Cerneski was the police chief of police, the Jewish police in the ghetto, and they did abominable things to their fellow Jews. Actually, Chinenko, uh, when it came time for the Acteon and the, uh, the, the removal of most of the hundreds of thousands of Jews to Treblinka, uh, he was asked to carry that out, and he killed himself. He couldn't do it. And so um, Lucy de Witterwitz, do you know that name? The Wars Against the Jews, very famous Jewish historian, no lover of Messianic Jews. She writes this. Some police chiefs and men were outsiders to the communities that they served, refugees or evacuees who found favor with the Germans by whom they were appointed. Some were apostates. Michas. In Warsaw, the first police chief was Josef Sinerski, formerly a colonel in the Polish police, a Catholic convert, reputedly an anti-Semite. He undoubtedly recruited police from a circle of apostate friends. And they worshipped in the two churches within the ghetto. So you had the real believers, the Jewish believers, and these other guys in the same church service. On March 18, 1941, Ringelblum noted that 100 apostates served in the police in visible positions. One of them, he added, was heard in church to have shouted, down with the Jews. Is it true? Um, maybe. I don't think a real Jewish believer would have said down with the Jews. Uh, but this is recorded in the Jewish side of the historical literature that survived. So I admire Ringelblum, but I have read most of his history. And he talks a lot about the Jewish believers. And he hated them because he basically said, these guys were the Jewish believers. And you had other Jewish believers who were michas. They did get baptized. They were traitors. Uh, but they just weren't as bad as these other guys. So the, here's the moral of the story. The wheat grows with the tares, friends. And only God can separate during the harvest. So the hardline socialists like Ringelblum and also the Orthodox Jews use these Jewish policemen as an example of how Jews who become Christians turn their back on the Jewish people. Now you have to remember, it's ludicrous. Anyway, I mean, you understand when they wrote it, things were hot. But all of those Jewish policemen were killed. None of them survived. Every single one of them were killed by the Nazis. So it didn't do them any good. Um, so in summary, even though Jewish Christians held critical roles in running the ghetto, uh, and people including uh, uh, Hertzfeld ran, I mean, they couldn't have survived without Hertzfeld um, finding ways to keep everybody dying from typhus. So he was a hero. But the Jewish Christians held critical roles in running the ghetto. They were still viewed with disdain by both the religious and the social, socialist ideologues, including Ringelblum, uh, who actually appointed one of his members of the Oineg Shabbos, uh, Marion um, Malowitz, who was a guy, to research the converts. And uh, listen to this. Malowitz gives a history of the situation before the war, underscoring the fact that only rarely did the assimilationist and Christian Jews support the cause of the Jewish people. As with most Jews writing in the ghetto, Malowitz presents baptism as a materialistic or socio-political choice. He simply does not consider the question of faith or religious belief. And he classifies the michas as assimilationists and traitors. So generally speaking, the Jewish believers, Protestant or Catholic, were viewed negatively 
by the mainstream Warsaw Jewish ghetto community. And uh, we just have to accept that that was true. Well, in a moment I'm going to close and then we'll take some uh, uh, questions. Fact is that they all perished together. What it, did it mean to be a Jew in the Warsaw Ghetto? It meant that you would die for being a Jew, no matter what you believed or what you practiced. Um, I have really come to love Hertzfield, and I've read most of his uh, book called Historia, um, and it's really quite a book. And, uh, and again, he became a believer later in life. Um, he saw a difference between authentic believers and inauthentic believers. He writes, on Sunday, all the Christians, and not only the Catholics, got that, attended Mass. Everybody was there, doctors, lawyers, those whose baptism was an expression of faith, those for whom it was a Polish symbol, and those who at a certain moment accepted their baptism to further their own self-interest. But all felt the need to gather at least once a week in the church and to participate in the service. So you see, Hertzfeld recognized that there were different layers of levels of faith. Hertzfeld says about uh, baptism, he says, there were many people who were baptized in the quarter, old and young, sometimes whole families. Some of my students were among them, men and women, and I was often asked to be the godfather. What motives drove them to the baptism? They never received any benefits from it. The change of faith didn't entail any change in their legal status. No, they were attracted to it by the appeal of the religion of love. They were attracted by the religion of the nation to which they felt they belonged. They were attracted to the religion to which there was no room, or at least should not be any room, for hatred. Jews were so weary of this universal hatred. And then, uh, uh, just a beautiful quote, just to help you understand his faith. Hirschfeld writes, Glory in excelsis Deo, in his, in his journal. Glory to God in the highest, and peace and goodwill to men. Grabowski Square and Twardo Street disappear. That's the heart of the ghetto. The excited and feverish crowd of the poor also disappears. We are immersed in the coldness and atmosphere of the place of worship. There is a throng of us that are lost in prayers. We can no longer see the killers and the haters. We are in the company of the enraptured. We are united in a sentiment of higher communion. And then he says, why should I love those monstrous, monstrous men for no reason? Love is a state of the spirit. Everybody possesses it, but sometimes in a dimmed and muffled state. But it as, is as much an instinct as the hunger for life, as the joy of living. Love is a delight as much as rapture amid the starry silence and the transport of joy of the dancing stars. There are no small things here. Everything emanates from the spirit. A heavenly music is heard. And in this harmony, the soul bends down, sobbing in humiliation. And it embraces the world in rapture. It floats in oblivion. Horrible things, horrible people disappear. All resonates with the greater, capital G, harmony. And so, do I believe Hertzfeld was a real believer? Uh, absolutely. I do. I believe he's a great example. Um, he escaped the ghetto and, uh, and lived to write about it, but he was one of a very few. Finally, uh, Dembowski, at the end of his book, tells a story that offers a fitting conclusion uh, uh, to this, to, our, to an understanding of the ghetto. Nothing more is to be found about the Christians in the Warsaw Ghetto after the great Acteon, the transporting of the majority of the population to Treblinka. A proper ending of this sad history of the two Roman Catholic parishes in the Warsaw Ghetto is to be found not only in the sympathetic farewell offered by a Jewish friend, 
but also in the poetic expression of post-war writer Hannah Kral, and uh, who was not herself uh, a religious, a religious Jew. She survived. In her Polish short story, Salvation, we read, when the Germans cleared the church of all the Christian Jews, there was only one Jew left of the church, the crucified Jesus. And Jesus came down from the cross and called to the painting of his mother, Mama Kim. This means in Yiddish, Mama come. And she came down and they went to the train to join their fellow Jews in Treblinka. Well, there's a lot to learn from the Messianic Jews of the Warsaw Ghetto. Don't let anybody ever tell you that the gospel didn't go out in the concentration camps or in the ghetto. It did. It absolutely did. And the Jewish believers were faithful. And they died with their fellow Jews. And I understand, and we'll talk about it tomorrow night, the Holocaust is one of the major reasons that Jewish people do not believe in Jesus because we, as Jews, were raised to believe that Christians perpetrated the Holocaust. But if you ask me, where were the Jewish believers during the Holocaust? They were dying with the rest of their people, just like we would have to do today. Were they martyrs? Were they heroes? Not by choice, but they were nonetheless. And where was Jesus during the destruction of the Jewish community? Well, he bore all our suffering and shame. I have to believe that Jesus, through his people, was present as well. Well, do you have a few more minutes? Do you? Okay. Um, maybe I can summarize a little bit, help just bring some more clarity to this. Just a few lessons that we can learn. It's not a time for lessons, by the way. It's a time for tears. But maybe we can learn a few lessons. As believers in Yeshua, we will often be viewed negatively by the Jewish community, even if and when we're suffering alongside our own people. The prejudice runs deep. even in Israel, where Jewish believers are serving alongside their Jewish countrymen in the army. Due to the negative history between Jews and Christians, our motivation for believing in Yeshua will always be a matter of suspicion on the part of the Jewish community. In the old days when I became a believer, you know, you did it for money. You did it to get a better job. Can you imagine? just? You know, less than 50 years ago. Our, our motives are always going to be tainted. The notion that historically some of the greatest anti-Semites were Jews converted to Christianity is part of the stigma we live, of, we live with because of our faith in Yeshua. Is it true? Well, anti-Semitism knows no ethnic boundaries. So for sure, there were anti-Semitic Jews. Um, and some of them were Christians, allegedly Christians, or identified as Christians. And um, they too need to face the Lord, don't they, one day. But we are tarred with their brush. Our identification with the Jewish community is not always a matter of choice but could result from a series of external circumstances. Um, you know, we, we have it good in America. 
I go to places in the world where Jewish people are persecuted because they're Jewish. Is it happening today? Are you kidding? All over the place. Of course it is. Do the Jewish believers get as persecuted as the regular Jews? Of course they do. Are we making some dramatic, romanticized choice to identify with our people in suffering? No, we don't have any choice. We're Jewish. And, you know, whether the Jewish community, mainstream community, thinks that we're insiders or outsiders, we know that we're insiders because we face the same suffering and persecution at all times as our fellow Jews. Finally, whoop, there you go, thanks, Bob. Be encouraged. The words of Romans 11, 5, 5 are true. As yesterday, today, and tomorrow, the Lord will preserve a remnant of Jewish followers of Yeshua in every age and under every circumstance. That includes the Warsaw Ghetto. That includes uh, Israel today. It includes uh, the, uh, uh, the Russia that my grandparents left, the Poland that my other grandparents left. What you have to see is you've got to draw back the curtain and see the faithfulness of God. He's always been there. The gospel's been proclaimed. The Jewish people have been able to hear about Yeshua. What happens in New York and Brooklyn today is no different than what happened in Warsaw, except that there were more of us. So God is faithful and hasn't forgotten his people. Well, I think we have about 15 minutes for easy questions. Scott. You mentioned the one historian said that there were tons of Jewish people getting baptized during the Holocaust. Yeah. Could I, would, I don't know if I use the word tons. The Catholics were even more severe than the Protestants in their catechizing of new believers. So you couldn't just walk in and say, you know, I, uh, my name is, is Mr. Schwartz and I'd like to become a Christian today. Do you think you could baptize me? You know, somehow we think that that's how it happened. Actually, they then had to join a six-month program where they went through the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed and had to go through extensive extensive training in the faith before they were baptized. And so we make it as if it was so easy, but it wasn't easy. And, the, and most of the Jewish believers, particularly in Poland at that time, were either Episcopal, Lutheran, or Reformed. And those were the, you notice the Baptists and Pentecostals were not listed a whole lot. So they were three because Jewish missions was often implemented by the state church of Western evangelical Christian countries from Scandinavia, from Germany, from England, and so on. And so there were very strict rules on who you could baptize and how much they needed to know in order to become baptized. And so the whole idea that people were indiscriminately, willy-nilly baptized is just not true. Did some people come and present themselves to want to do that? Of course. Who knows? I might have in order to save myself and my family. But it didn't happen so easily. And, and that's a fact of history that sometimes the Jewish historians just gloss over in basically minimizing the faith commitment of Jews who believe in Jesus. Next question. Gordon. Thank you for sharing this with me. Um, the, uh, you talk about in the, uh, the Week of Passover, the uh, Palestinian Catholic family said that they hate each other. In Poland? Yeah, in Poland. 
Yes, even till today. Okay, well, that's a mouthful of questions there, Gordon. You, I know, they just were flowing. I'll try, I'll try, and, I'll try and address them, if I remember. Um, I don't know, I, I haven't seen the research about the interaction. He didn't say much about it. No, his sources were mostly mostly Catholic, and then the Protestant sources are mostly Protestant. So, how they uh, how they got along, I don't know. And you have to remember that the missionaries were outsiders, so the Protestants and the Catholics from outside may not have gotten along as well as the Protestants and the Catholics who were inside. Okay, because it was a much tighter uh, community, and and so on. So I don't know. And uh, I would think that um, even if the, well, let me tell you a story. So one of the priests who wrote, who, uh, who wrote afterwards, uh, talked about his own journey, where at first, um, you have to understand the Poles hated the Nazis. This is why that big debate is happening right now. It's a huge debate. I've experienced it firsthand, where I've said the wrong thing and I've been blasted by Polish people because I presumed that Polish evangelical Christians believe that there were bad Poles who persecuted Jews. They don't. They say, no, 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 no. We, especially evangelicals like the like Bonhoeffer's people and others you know uh, confessing church we we were persecuted by the Nazis so no uh, the Poles the Christ, the real Christian Poles you know uh, hated the Nazis and the Poles hated the Nazis too so the, the, you can't say the Poles did it it was the, the Nazis who did it and then of course you have all the experiences and all the documentation of Polish people helping the Nazis. It's a very, it is not a cut and dry situation. Let me tell you, it's very difficult out there. And uh, so if you go to Warsaw, Poland, watch what you say. And uh, uh, listen a lot before you say something. And so uh, I, would, I would tell you that this one Polish priest was an anti-Semite. He confessed it. And then he watched the ghetto, and he watched the Jews coming into his church. And he said, I went through a major repentance and asked God to forgive me for my anti-Semitism. Another one of the priests who were, was harboring Jews in the church, they were harboring Jews in the church and uh, hiding them when the Nazis were trying to round them up and bring them to Treblinka. He was, they were hiding the Jews. And uh, one of the well-known priests was shot on the steps of his church as an example of what would happen if people harbored Jews in the ghetto, among the, in the churches. Because there were also tunnels underneath and so on. So, uh, I'm sure that you know, the, some of the Polish Catholic priests did have some anti-Semitic tendencies. I think to some degree was in the culture, but, you know, I'm, I'm really being very careful nowadays as to what I say because um, before I would have made more blanket statements, oh yeah, the Poles hated the Jews, I would never say that again. I, I now realize that's, that's wrong. And, uh, and particularly, the faithful 
Catholics, uh, faithful Poles, Catholic or Protestant. Some of them, of course, were probably, I mean, racism and uh, anti-Semitism is in the culture in America too. I mean, we, we know that. Racism is one of the great sins of the church. And maybe some of you have experienced that kind of racism in your own soul, and, and we need to repent of racism. Racism is always wrong. It's always sin, no matter what race you discriminate against. It's, it's bad. And so um, I'm sure that was in the culture of some, but to say it's in the culture of every, everyone would say, might be getting up here and saying, you know, all of you Christians, sincere and sincere, but are racists or anti-Semites. You can't say that. So it was a very difficult issue. So Catholic priests died in the ghetto for helping Jews. It's true. I don't know what to do with all that, Gordon. It breaks down my stereotypes. I guess I thank God that it did. Doug? I'm just going to add that uh, Rashmore Friedman told us that he had gone into the ghetto near the end to live at between 22 and 27 young Jewish believers like he was. And he went to visit them, and that's when they told him after a couple of days, I don't know exactly how long, you better go out and find this place. He, there were 10 workmen going out of the ghetto the day it fell, and, and but there were only nine. It's supposed to be 10. So the, so the officer said, no, uh, you know, Rashmore, you, you take the place where you need to stay. He did. So he walked out. Just, and then it fell. That's how it happened. Those are, this, every story of survival is a miracle. Yeah. Uh, can you clarify, were you saying that none of the Jews survived, even the ones that converted from the bad times? Well, they, no, so a, f a few survived. Oh. A few survived. But for the most part, I mean, it was just a handful. But even many of the ones that were baptized? Oh, yeah, of course. There was no difference. See, that's the point. That's the key point. You've got to understand that. There was no difference in the way the Nazis viewed people as to whether they were Christians, Jews, or Messianic Jews. There's no difference. And yet the Jewish community sometimes tells us, well, you're not really Jewish. You know, well, really? My spiritual ancestors were Messianic Jews, and they died with your spiritual ancestors. So, don't, you know, how do you get somebody who feels that way to recognize their prejudice towards Messianic Jews? Was there prejudice against Messianic Jews? You better believe it. And, you st and we'll talk about that, because it's, a, it's, it's this whole sort of um, interaction that impacts our ministry of, to Jewish people today. We'll, we'll get into that tomorrow night. Don't miss it. There's a lot more. One or two more questions? That's it? Ah, one more. How long have you been a believer? Since 2003. Okay. Uh, how old is your dad? 58. 50? 58. 58. Young man. And um, where does he live? He's just a bank. Okay. So uh, the, the, the Brooklyn Jewish culture is very insular. And so because of that, uh, he probably has... And, we're, and your family's from what part of Europe? From Russia. Right. So basically, all of these attitudes towards Christianity were formed in Europe. And they came along with your grandparents or great-grandparents to Brooklyn. And there's hundreds of years 
of prejudice against Jesus and against Jewish people who believe in Jesus. It's part of your father's worldview. He doesn't think about it. It's just part of his soul, just like the sky is blue. So he's not, he's angry at you. He's disappointed in himself as a father. I understand that from a father's perspective. And he's grieving. He's embarrassed. So he has all of these feelings. I've felt for my own parents and grandparents, and, and I feel for your dad too. Um, there's only uh, one way to handle this, and that's not to say anything and just be the best daughter in the world. And when you're the best daughter in the world, you've said more than you could say. Because when we speak, we're trying to logically or rationally debate the issue. When there's nothing to debate, it's part of his worldview. So you have to ask, God's the only one who could break down someone's uh, Worldview, I hope everybody understands. If not, look it up at Wikipedia. You'll find out what worldview means. So, But you, he, you'll, you'll never be able to... I, I, always, I, I watch sometimes a witnessing dialogue between people where uh, we're sharing the gospel with a, a Jewish family member or so on, and you just, you're watching the dialogue and you say, guys, you know, why, are you, why are you talking? You know, you're just going to get mad at each other. You know, so... When his worldview starts, uh, starting, starts having some disappointments or holes in it, which it will, eventually. When it does, it might be health reasons, it might be disappointment reasons, it might be aging reasons. There's a lot of reasons why that can happen. When that happens, then you have your moment. But you've got to spend your life building trust and relationship so that when that moment comes, he'll listen. Okay? One last question, and then Greg's going to preach a sermon, so you know I better. Anything else? All righty. I hope that you'll come back tomorrow night. We're going to talk very specifically about how this um, impacts Jewish missions, but then we're also going to talk about the impact of the Holocaust itself on the Messianic Jewish movement globally and in Europe and what happened then and what happened afterwards and what's happening now. So I think it'll be interesting and you'll never get around, no matter what anybody says, you'll never get around the Holocaust. Um, not in this generation or the next generation. It's just you're not going to get you're not going to get around it. So we have to deal with it. Uh, uh, for me, this is a heartbreaking day. Uh, personally, I lost many relatives in the Holocaust. Um, I, I saw their pictures in my grandparents' home. Okay. But, okay, so I'll tell you, um, it is a, uh, a time where I think we need to identify with the entire Jewish community. And uh, wh one of the most moving times I've ever spent on Yom HaShoah was we were actually visiting Paris. And uh, it was on Yom HaShoah, we walked up the street they had set up a big tent, and the place was packed with the Jewish community, and they were naming the name of every Jewish person in Paris who died in the Holocaust. And uh, we sat there, my wife and I, for hours listening. And uh, it wasn't her relative, but it was the same name as her father and and uh, it's just incredibly moving and uh, it's a time to remember um, 
It's a time to remember that even in spite of the darkness of this day, and it is dark, in spite of the darkness of this day, that we have the light of the world in our souls, in our hearts, and that we have hope. And we also have sorrow in this world. Didn't Yeshua talk about that? In this world you will have what? Fun and joy and uh, everything will be uh, fun and games and tribulation. You know, in this world we will genuinely have sadness. But the day is coming when he'll wipe every tear from our eyes. So would you pray with me? And uh, then Greg will come up and close. Let's pray together. Loving Father, we thank you for the one who innocently suffered for the sins of the world. We cannot fathom the pain and all that he went through on that day, on that Pesach so many years ago. But we're grateful that he bore our sin, our punishment, our pain, our diseases, we thank you that he did that, not just for us, but for the whole world, and especially, for, of course, for those who believe. And Lord, we thank you for the legacy of the Holocaust. We can only imagine that those Jewish believers who suffered and died are now filled with joy in your presence. And knowing that, Lord, gives us hope and Lord, we know that in this world we have tribulation. We pray, Lord, that we'll always be able to keep our eye on the one who finished the race and who's the joy of our lives. And Abba Father, we pray for our Jewish brothers and sisters scattered all across the globe who today are remembering this awful nightmare of the Holocaust who lost so many loved ones and relatives, husbands and wives and uncles and aunts and cousins and, and Lord, uh, who are now elderly themselves. And on this day, maybe even their memories are, make it difficult because of age to remember the way they would like to remember. And so, Lord, I pray for those who are grieving and those who lost loved ones in the Holocaust. I pray, Lord, that somehow you might manifest yourself to them, particularly to those that are, that are older. And Lord, I, I pray for our Jewish community, Lord, that they would be strong and courageous Lord, I pray, Father, that, uh, that there would be many Analeviches among the Jewish people in Israel, in Brooklyn, and all throughout the world. Thank you, Lord, for their bold example. And Lord, help us in a spiritual sense to be similar, to be bold, to stand for you. And Lord, uh, to battle for righteousness. And Lord, I just pray that you would give understanding to our loved ones so that they would recognize that your son Yeshua is not the author of evil and that the Holocaust is not a work of God but a work that demonstrates to us the evil of mankind. Lord, thank you for this evening. Thank you for these heroes of the Holocaust, like Rachmiel, like Dr. Hertzfield, like Bas Basili Yach, who stood for you in the midst of a difficult time. Thank you, Lord, that we stand on the shoulders of great Messianic Jewish heroes who lived and loved you 
and who brought the message of Yeshua, and who, many of whom even could have gotten out at times, but they decided to die with their people and their families. And so, Lord, I pray that you would use this day to help us remember your goodness and faithfulness and to remember this in a very sober way the evil that man is capable of. And then to remember that you are a God who does give life, who does raise the dead. And Lord, we pray that we would live in light of that hope each and every day. We pray these things in the wonderful name of your Son, our Messiah Yeshua, the Jewish Messiah, for all. We pray in his name. Amen.